that's what happened. That's just harassment immediately go there. So there's a potential when you suffer. I've also had many letters, communications from people in prison who say, my sentence is either life or my sentence is another 10, 20 years as I have. I've read your books or I've listened to a talk and suddenly I realized something and I became totally peaceful. So several people in prison have gone there because they have set out of thinking and they realized the source of their unhappiness actually was not the actual situation, although normally it would be regarded as pretty bad to be stuck in a prison cell. And even worse, knowing that you're going to be in for another 10, 20 years or the rest of your life. So they, they realized that ultimately their suffering was not due to the situation, but to the mental commentary about the situation. And so they, the mental commentary became so unbearable it collapsed by either with the help of the spiritual teaching and sometimes by itself and what remained was just a sense of pure presence, awareness, mindfulness yes. and that, that is the real spiritual awakening when something emerges from within you that is deeper than who you thought you were the, the personal sense of self so the person, the person is still there but one could almost say that something more powerful shines through the person. And so, but you don't, you don't have to wait for the diagnosis by the doctor or to be put in prison. Maybe that's good news. No, I don't think you either do have to do 30,000 hours of meditation uh, or live in an ashram for 20 years. There's a, you can, um, once you get a glimpse of it, you can invite it into your life, in daily life, I call it mini meditations, and actually step out of thinking and into presence. Well, definitely, if I may just go to a little example now, just for you to experience as you sit here. Um, you can turn around as you sit here with your attention, you can direct your attention, for example, onto your visual perceptions, where this is the room, this is the speaker here, the lights, the ceiling. You can direct your attention into your hands. You can feel your lightness in your hands. You can choose where your attention goes. It doesn't have to be in thinking. You can direct your attention into the feeling of your body on the chair. You can put this a choice of where you want to put your attention. And then you can direct your attention I ask you, what does it feel like to be you? This is a very strange question. Uh, now you may not know exactly where to direct your attention. And I'm not talking of the body, you, of, an, of a deeper sense of beingness. What does it feel like to be you without remembering your history, not me, the person who had that kind of experience and that kind of... No, a deeper sense of... The, more, the more essential sense of... Highness of beingness, what does that feel like? So I'm asking you to direct your attention to something very intangible. Uh, but you may get a glimpse of what that intangible thing or no thing is. And the strange thing is, it is no different from the attention itself. So when you look for yourself with the spotlight of your attention, and then you realize the attention itself is this, that in other words, <laughs> you recognize yourself as the consciousness that was looking for yourself. <laughs> so uh, the, this is a little bit paradoxical, but perhaps the truth often is paradoxical. So yeah, look, Jesus, I believe, talks about that, or the misunderstood mostly. Uh, in such I don't think I've heard, ever heard that these words explained properly. He says, the kingdom of heaven as you know, he said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Now, kingdom of heaven, these are words that are belong to different time periods. Uh, we don't, kingdom is not used that much anymore. I think if he lived nowadays, he would, instead of kingdom, he would have said dimension. And heaven refers to a sense of vastness or spaciousness. 
So this is what is in many spirit traditions. The sun, heaven is used in many languages. Sky and heaven is the same word in English. You have two words. But it's the vast expansiveness. So there's a dimension of spaciousness, as I call it. So if we retrans translate the words of Jesus into a modern term, the dimension of spaciousness is within you. And then Jesus said, uh, when they asked him, well, where, where, where is the kingdom of heaven and when is it going to come? Because they're always waiting for it to come. And he said, the kingdom of heaven does not, this is the, by the way, this is literal, literal from the Bible. The kingdom of heaven does not come with signs to be perceived. You cannot say, ah, it's over here, or look, it's over there. For I tell you, the kingdom of heaven is within you. So he is pointing to that which he can never make into an object of consciousness like everything else. He can say, here's the table. If the table becomes an object in consciousness, the thought that arises becomes an object in consciousness and then dissolves again. An emotion that you feel is an object in consciousness and then it dissolves again. But how is it possible for a sense perception even to be there, for an emotion to be felt, or for a thought to be there? What is it that enables that to be there? It could not be there without the light of consciousness in which it appears. It appears in the light of consciousness. For example, you can doubt that they, where we are right here, that this is actually happening. And there have been many sages and philosophers who questioned the reality of our everyday experience and that maybe it's all a dream. So philosophers, there's a dream-like quality to our existence because every experience passes very quickly and it's long, it's like a dream. So there is a dream-like quality and we could sit here for hours and argue whether or not this is actually real. As of course, uh, Descartes uh, has a, he, said, he sat down, Descartes sat down and said, well, is, it, is there anything that I cannot doubt? So he also looked at, okay, whether or not this table actually exists, I can doubt, because it may be a total misinterpretation of something else. Uh, obviously, if I looked at the atomic structure, I would no longer see a table. I would see mostly empty space, 99% empty space, and a few patches and molecules floating around. But we call it a table, and the same with your body. So, we you can doubt all that, that all that is real, or what is the thing in itself. Maybe other philosopher asked. So, Descartes sat there and said, What is there anything that I cannot doubt? And he was thinking and thinking and thinking, and then he said, Ah! I'm always thinking. I think, therefore I am. So he equated thinking with existence or beingness. If he had not stopped there and had waited a little longer and come to the end of thinking where he realized the answer has not been found through thinking and then reached the stage of thoughtless awareness, then he would actually have found the, the, the deeper truth of, of I am. <laughs> Well, maybe we can chat about that for a moment, where we talk about, if you will, the loss of ego and spiritual context. We hear quantum physicists talk about quantum consciousness. We hear people talk about oneness. Uh, is once you separate out the thought, and there just is the is, is that the oneness we're talking about, or what are your thoughts? <laughs> so we're using thought to point to something that's beyond thought. That's uh, the, how it works. And also, the, uh, the, the sense of separateness or separation arises through continuous labeling of the, your, all your life experiences. Uh, in, uh, which is particularly harmful in the case of other human beings when you relate to other human beings the moment you meet somebody you again through this, this stream of thinking that it involuntarily arises through your conditioning will immediately interpret the other person with thoughts if there's any called judgments good or bad more, usually more negative than positive in most people's case <laughs> And that creates a sense of separation, even when you walk in the forest or uh, you immediately interpret everything. 
the, it's the reality that you inhabit becomes a conceptual reality. So you lose touch, it's as if a stream was suddenly arising between yourself and the aliveness around you in other human beings, in nature. So you cannot sense the inherent aliveness in nature anymore. And you cannot sense the inherent aliveness in another human being anymore because you reduce everything to mental concepts. So when you are totally, continuously immersed in the, in the thinking, scheme of thinking, you begin to inhabit a conceptual reality which separates you from the actual aliveness that's all around you. And that's what the source of separation, sense of separation, is. Uh, involuntary continuous labeling of everything and including yourself you do it to yourself you label yourself in certain ways people have opinions about who they are and they vary some people are predominantly negative which is very unpleasant to live with a very self-critical mind that, that always says well, why did you do that you should have done better and so on maybe it's your mother talking still but it's all <laughs> So you have, you have that is very, it's a dreadful thing to have that in your head. So then you become, you can become free of that by realizing these are the thoughts and here is the, the, the actual situation. I lost the train of thought, by the way. <laughs> uh, we're talking about separation. So, separation of life, where they just, I am, that's how it's gone. That's how you do it. <laughs> separation then arises through that, as you can, when you go into nature, really, we can talk about in terms of knowing, you can, you can know, I like walking in nature, in the forest, and I can, I, I can do that in two ways. I can walk through the forest and look at the trees and birds and the ferns and all the wonderful things and she comments on it and say this is this that, that's called that, or oh, this wonderful bird, I wonder what it's called, so and so on and all kinds of commentary. That's one way of knowing the forest, but I can also walk through the forest and simply be absolutely present and observe without labeling it. In that sense, from a conceptual point of view, I don't know anything anymore. But there is a deep unknowing there where I can suddenly sense something that the conceptual mind can never feel, and that is the forest is alive, there is an energy field there, there is even a sacredness there, and everything is intensely alive, and I become still, and, and, and there is a sense of merging with that which you are observing with your sense perceptions. And so the sense of separation goes away. And there is a sense of oneness with that which you are perceiving. It's no longer the me and the other. Because that's true conceptualization. And, when, and that's beautiful when you can walk in a forest like that. The experience of being in the forest is greatly enhanced. And if you can relate with another, to another human being like that, then it's a true relating. And here we come to compassion, I would say that true compassion with another human being, which is closely related to the ability to empathize, to feel the beingness of the other, to sense your way into the other, uh, is also closely related to uh, what we could call goodwill towards another being, benevolence, Confucius already pointed to benevolence is one of the most important things. He says, you are not even fully human if the faculty of benevolence, which is goodwill, all the, all the facets of the same faculty, has not arisen in you. Confucius says you are not even fully human yet. So that compassion, the benevolence, the goodwill, the ability to empathize, to ultimately recognize the other as not absolutely other all arises when the habitual and unconscious and compulsive labeling of others no longer operates and that's where compassion can arise 
absolutely before we came out, we were actually talking about uh, barriers to being compassionate or connecting to others. And we were actually uh, talking about how wonderful it is to have an animal, like a dog, uh, because they never judge you, right? And that's really what we all want, is because I, that's one of our fears, is that when we intersect with another, we're going to be judged. And you have this animal that uh, un, uh, hesitantly embraces you, and in, in fact, we were also talking about enlightened people, or people who are wonderful to be around. Not that they're dogs, but they're... Uh, <laughs> but what they do is, you, you, when you're with these people, you have this incredible sense they didn't just accept you for who you are with no judgment, uh, no demands. You're just there at that moment. And I think that's, yes, yes. The joke of course, is a wonderful example. People you don't talk about the GPS. See, the GPS doesn't judge you either, does it? Never raises its voice. And this is right. The, the GPS uh, never tells you, why do you not listen to me? Why? How many times? Why? How many times have I told you to sound this way? <laughs> so we're writing a book, uh, Dogs and GPS. But as a dog, of course, uh, you, I know that you've heard the prayer. Please, God, make me into the person my dog thinks I am. <laughs> Now the dog, of course, the secret is the dog doesn't think, it just experiences you, it has no labels towards you, it doesn't have the contextual reality, it has the direct reality, so there's this enormous joy of life in the dog as expressed in the sail, the wagging sail, which is, and, and this is why many human beings love relating to animals, because they feel this unconditional 